Good evening. I'm Margaret Bentwood. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Helena area, I want to thank the Lewis and Clark Public Library for co-hosting tonight's lecture by the Honorable Jim Nelson. Justice Nelson has titled his lecture, Ask Not What You Can Do. Very intriguing. And special thanks to Suzanne Switzenberg of the Lewis and Clark Public Library who is managing this webinar and will join us later for questions and answers. As a program note, in a future program on March 22nd, the League and the Library will be holding a second webinar on the Montana Constitution, which will focus on the right to vote. Presenters will include Professor Jeremy Johnson, political scientist and teacher at Carroll College, and Helena attorney, Mike Malloy, who is representing litigants with voting rights claims in Montana court. Other attorneys involved in litigation to protect Montana's voting rights will also be participating in talking about why protecting voting rights matters. So we hope you will keep that in mind and look for the announcement to come regarding the March 22nd voting rights webinar. This year, in 2022, the League of Women Voters is celebrating the 50th anniversary of the ratification of the 1972 Montana Constitution. Back in 1971, League members studied the issues involved in the Montana Constitution. And then in 1972, League members testified numerous times at the Constitutional Convention and wrote many letters supporting the proposed constitution. In fact, the other day, my neighbor told me that his mother, a league member, went door to door in 1972 in Stevensville, Montana, to explain to her friends and neighbors why the Montana voters should vote yes in the 1972 referendum. Our league mothers worked very hard to encourage Montana voters to ratify this very modern constitution. And we believe that it's worth defending. And tonight in 2022, we celebrate its 50th anniversary. We could not think of a more suitable speaker for this purpose than the Honorable Jim Nelson, who served as an Associate Justice of the Montana Supreme Court for 20 years, from 1993 to 2013. He was appointed by Governor Mark Roscoe to the bench, and he was reelected three times by the people of Montana. It's Montana's good fortune that since his retirement from the court, Justice Nelson has pivoted to community education and he's been generous in sharing his knowledge and experience with Montanans across the state. So we count ourselves very lucky to have him share his perspective on the Montana Constitution. Obviously, we know that Justice Nelson brings a great resource of legal knowledge and judicial philosophy to his perspective, but I'm most interested in other aspects of his background. And I think you will be too, because I think they really hold a key to understanding who he is and what he has to say. He's from the Mountain West and grew up in Northern Idaho. Justice Nelson graduated with a business degree with honors from the University of Idaho in 1966. In 1969, he was discharged as a first lieutenant in the US Army. Having served his country honorably for three years, in 1974, he received his Juris Doctor degree, again with honors, from George Washington University School of Law. During his law school years, he worked as a financial analyst with the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Following his law school graduation, and this is where it gets interesting. Justice Nelson began practicing law in Cut Bank, Montana, 
which he did for 20 years, serving individuals, farmers, ranchers, small businesses, the First Interstate Bank of Glacier County, the Glacier Electric Cooperative, a Native American tribe, among other clients. He handled domestic matters, real estate, litigation, contracts, wills, probates, and estate, and oil and gas matters. Significantly, he was Glacier County attorney and prosecutor for 14 years. I think it is fair to assert that over the course of those 20 years, he came to know the people of Montana very well. And Justice Nelson also began to perform public service during those years. He served as president of the Chamber of Commerce. He served as chairman of the State Board of Oil and Gas Conservation. He served as a member of the State Gaming Advisory Council, and he was appointed to the Governor's Task Force on Corrections and Criminal Justice Policy. On a couple of occasions, he taught classes at the University of Montana School of Law. Not to be forgotten, he also served as a volunteer fireman. As you will learn tonight, Justice Nelson is a man who stands with and for the people of Montana. And now you know a little bit about why that may be the case. And before I go, I would be remiss not to emphasize that he had a life partner who helped him through all these years. Justice Nelson has been married to Sherry Nelson for 50 years, and he, they are the parents of two children and grandparents of four. Well, thank you all for joining the League of Women Voters and the Lewis and Clark Public Library tonight in welcoming the Honorable Jim Nelson. Thank you, Margaret, for the very warm introduction. And thank you all uh, for the gift of your time, your being present here this evening. I'm really honored to be able to speak to you about the Montana Constitution and to a lesser extent, our federal constitution. And I too would like to add my thanks to the Helena League of Women Voters and the Lewis and Clark uh, Library. A special thanks to John Finn, director of the library for making its facilities available. And my added thanks to adult library services librarian, Suzanne Switzenberg, uh, without whose technical assistance this presentation would not be possible. You know, I have given talks at other times and venues about both our federal and Montana state constitutions. And I must confess, I typically talked about how our constitutions came to be and how important they are. Basically, I ended up asking my listeners to wave the flag and to genuflect at the altar of democracy then we all went home and I suspect forgot about the documents we purported to honor. The documents enshrining our most basic and fundamental laws and values, reflecting who we are as a people, having chosen democracy as our form of government, were left disembodied, distant, and seemingly irrelevant to the problems and challenges of everyday life. Indeed, usually these talks were a little more than feel-good presentations of preaching to the choir. This is the con conundrum that occurred to me when I was asked to give the Constitution Day speech at Carroll College in September of 2019. So I decided to do something different. I decided to suggest a path of honoring our constitutions every day, a way of making them relevant, a path that I hope you will take home with you. To that end, I'm not going to talk about how our constitutions came to be. I expect that most of you know those histories, or likely you wouldn't be here. This won't be a history lecture. I will mention our federal constitution where it serves a point I'm trying to make, but primarily I want to focus my remarks on our own Montana constitution. To be sure, both our federal and state constitutions are critically important. Both set up the three branches of government and some administrative type matters, and both protect our most important and cherished rights. But the two are not the same in important respects, 
That is why I will talk mostly about Montana's constitution. I don't want you to feel leave here tonight feeling good. Rather, my goal is that you leave here feeling empowered. I want you to leave knowing that our Montana constitution is not just a historical document, but that it is a living document as well, a working document whose principles adapt to times and technologies vastly different than existed when it was written in 1972 and later adopted. I want you to leave here with the belief that our constitution is not just a defensive document to be trotted out when someone's right is violated. It's just not a document telling the state public officials what they can and cannot do. But just as importantly, it's an offensive document to be used as a template for adjudicating and legislating better governance and a stronger democracy. To that point, I want you to leave here with one thought in mind. To paraphrase the, wor paraphrase the words of former President John F. Kennedy, I want each of you to ask yourself not, what can I do for my constitution? I'd rather have you ask, what can my constitution do for me? And to that end, I want you to start formulating your own vision of what your Montana constitution means to you and what it can do for you individually, for your families, for your state, and for your country. I want you to think outside the box in forming your vision. I don't want you to be bound by what the law is. Rather, I want you to formulate your vision of what the law could be and should become if our elected officials and our judges broadly interpreted and aggressively applied our constitution so as best to protect our lives, liberties, and property. I want you to envision ways to make our constitution work for you in new ways to meet the challenges of the circumstances, situations, and technologies of the time in which we are living now and into the future. Montana's is the most progressive constitution in the country, and it is the obligation of each of us to keep it that way. Our constitution guarantees more rights than does the federal constitution, 17 additional rights by some count. Rights to a clean and healthful environment, to inviolable human dignity, to participate in government, to see and examine public documents, to individual privacy, special rights to vote, to learn about native cultures, and for initiative and referendum to name just a few. And I'll be talking about some of these rights in more depth tonight. Importantly though, I want you to appreciate and never forget that this is our constitution. It's not the government's, not corporate America's, not the super PACs, not the Democrats, the Republicans or the Libertarians, and not some churches. Our constitution does not belong to any political party or religion or special interest group. Indeed, our Montana constitution begins with three very personal words, we the people. Our constitution belongs to every person in Montana. Our constitution belongs to us. So here's our roadmap. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about 50 minutes or so, and then we'll take some comments and questions through uh, Mary and Suzanne. Frankly, I wish our meeting was in person instead of in cyberspace so that we could have a more open discussion, but the risks of COVID being what they are, that isn't possible. I want to begin first with an important principle of constitutional law. State constitutions can provide more and different rights than the federal constitution, and state constitutions can provide more protection of rights guaranteed under the federal constitution than does the federal constitution itself. But importantly, states cannot provide less rights or less protections than federally guaranteed rights. For example, unlike the federal constitution, Montana's constitution has written into it 
a textual right of individual privacy at Article 2, Section 10. Our Montana Supreme Court has interpreted this provision to provide more protection of individual privacy than does the federal constitution. For example, Montanans enjoy enhanced protection of their right of individual privacy in a number of different contexts, such as informational privacy, personal autonomy privacy, healthcare privacy, and in search and seizure, to name just a few. Under the federal constitution, the concept of privacy is derived not from the document's actual text, but is intuited from a penumbra of other textually stated and protected liberty interests. I appreciate that all this must seem a bit complicated and arcane, arcane but hang with me and we'll see how this very important principle works out in actual practice. So with all of this in mind, I want to give you just a few examples of what your vision of how Montana's constitution can work for you might include. These are just my examples, my starting points. Your vision is yours to make. So let's begin with a challenge that I suggest is one of the most important we will ever face. Homo sapiens are the first species ever to have evolved to the point of being able to physically change the climate of our planet. We are the first species capable of ending life on Earth as we know it. Our very existing is causing our global climate to warm unnaturally. It is causing the ice in our polar regions to melt and our seas to rise and is causing mass extinctions of other plant and animal species on an unprecedented and unnatural scale. We are reproducing like a plague of locusts, devouring our planet's resources and polluting its environments. In a mere 30 years, our planet's resources, uh, in a mere 30 years, excuse me, there will be likely to be 2.5 billion more humans on this planet competing for the same air, water, food, and resources and living space that the present 7 billion humans are. And the planet's climate uh, will have risen approximately two degrees Celsius. The science supporting these facts is unassailable. The deniers be damned. We are headed for an unimaginable train wreck of global proportions. Indeed, scientists maintain that we're living in a new geologic epoch, the Anthropocene, described as the period commencing with the Industrial Revolution and following during which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. As prescient as the framers were in 1787 and in 1972, they did not and in fairness could not possibly have foreseen what our species would do to our earth, not only in the following two centuries under the federal constitution, but in the mere 50 years since Montana's constitution was adopted. Indeed, they could not have foreseen that more than half the carbon uploaded into the atmosphere by human activity would occur within the last three decades. That means that in just one generation, we humans will have done as much damage to our planet's, planet's ability to sustain life that has occurred in all the millennia that came before. The extra heat we spew out, largely from burning fossil fuels, which we trap in the atmosphere near our planet's surface, is the equivalent to the heat from the detonation of 400,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs every day. That's four every second. I suggest that saving our planet from us will be our greatest challenge in the next 50 years. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has endorsed the idea that to avert catastrophic climate change, there needs to be a global, global mobilization of effort and technology on the scale of World War II now. But what does climate change have to do with our Montana constitution? How could we make our 
constitutions, both of them actually, work for us to meet this challenge? Well, let me posit some thoughts and a proposal. As a start, consider the 14th Amendment to the Federal Constitution. This amendment is not part of the Bill of Rights. Rather, it was adopted after the Civil War, basically to protect the rights of former slaves. It has, however, been very broadly interpreted by the US Supreme Court in a number of different contexts. Among other things, the 14th Amendment prohibits states from depriving persons of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. To date, this due process clause has been applied as a restraint or limitation on governmental power or state action. But why shouldn't our courts interpret this clause against government inaction? An interpretation that would impose an affirmative duty on government to take steps to ensure that we are not deprived of life, liberty, or property as a result of climate change. Inaction in the face of a national and global crisis. And why shouldn't that interpretation serve as a template for congressional legislative action and court decisions? It is certain that the effects of climate change will adversely impact our lives, liberty, and property. No doubt, many people will be deprived of these cherished rights outright as our coastal cities and regions are inundated, as our agricultural food baskets are flooded or are turned into deserts, as parts of our nation are, other, are otherwise rendered uninhabitable, and as our economy and job markets are damaged. Arguably, while government action may not be able to prevent these in the near term, responsible governance global leadership, and our good example may mitigate these impending harms so that the governments throughout the world can begin to substantively address climate change for the long term. Is this pie in the sky thinking? Well, let me offer another fact about the federal constitution that many of you may or may not be aware of. If you look at the textual language of the federal constitution, you will find that there are no rights guaranteed for non-human legal entities. That is to say, corporations, partnerships, associations, super PACs, let's just call these collectively corporations for short. None of these corporations are guaranteed any protection of life, liberty, or property under the constitution as written, not a single right. Indeed, you will not even find the word corporation in the text of the federal constitution at all. Yet we know full well that such non-human legal entities enjoy many, not all, but many of the same constitutional rights that we human beings do. The right of free speech, religious liberty, freedom of the press, due process, equal protection, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, the right to counsel, the right to a jury trial, the right against double jeopardy, for example. To date, corporations do not have the right to vote or to keep and bear arms, but that's about it. So how did corporations come to possess these rights and guarantees when they were not textually provided for them in the language of the federal constitution? Quite simply, in over two centuries of jurisprudence, the United States Supreme Court has created from whole cloth the rights and guarantees I just referred to for corporations by broadly interpreting the Constitution, including the First and Fourteenth Amendments. The court simply grew the Constitution to provide protections to encompass the business models, the technologies, and the social and economic circumstances that evolved in the years following the late 1700s. So here's my proposal. If the Supreme Court can broadly interpret the federal constitution to create rights for corporations, why couldn't, indeed, why shouldn't the court also broadly interpret the constitution so as to protect the lives, liberty, and property of us, actual human beings, from the government's failure, unwillingness, 
and refusal to aggressively address the effects of climate change to the extent reasonably possible. Aren't we human beings entitled to, to uh, uh, have our government do what it can do, not only in our nation, but by leadership and example in the world to protect us from climatological danger that is more serious than any threat of a world war or other natural or man-caused disaster that we've ever faced in the past. And if our government fails to act, why shouldn't we be able to assert a claim against the government that our lives, our liberty, and our property are being injured? Why shouldn't the court issue an injunction commanding Congress and the executive to act on our behalf and to, and to require our citizens to be compensated for their injuries if the government fails to act responsibly? Why shouldn't our constitution be available for us to use offensively in this fashion? That's not the law now, obviously, but it could be. And in my vision, at least it should be. This is one thing that our federal constitution could do for us. More to the point, however, our Montana constitution already contemplates just such a remedy. In our constitution's Declaration of Rights, Article 2, Section 3, Montanans are guaranteed the inalienable right to a clean and healthful environment, in addition to the inalienable rights to pursue life's basic necessities, acquire, possess, and protect property, and to seek safety, health, and happiness in all lawful ways. Inalienable means that these rights cannot be taken away or denied. Would you not agree with me that climate change infringes on all of these rights, especially the right to a clean and healthful environment? We, the people, are guaranteed these rights textually in our Montana Constitution. They are fundamental rights. A few years ago, our Montana Supreme Court rejected the opportunity to entertain an action grounded in the right to a clean and healthful environment and dealing with, if my memory serves correct, air pollution. However, there is another lawsuit presently pending in Lewis and Clark County that is grounded in this right and filed by various people who will be most affected by climate change in the coming years. We should all closely be following Held versus State as it progresses through the district court and then probably onto the Montana Supreme Court. Moreover, I suggest that knowing what we know now about the juggernaut of climate change that is upon us, it is time that our legislature and our courts consider laws and decisions that will give real voice and meaning to our Article 2, Section 3 rights. Climate change is the antithesis of these rights. Vigorously enforcing our Article 2, Section 3 rights in concert with our right to a clean and healthful environment is something that our Montana Constitution can do for us. Every one of us should be demanding this of our executive, legislative, and judicial offices. And that too is part of my vision. Well, let's now shift to a different constitutional right. <clears throat> In the early 1970s, uh, even before Roe Ro versus Wade was decided in 1972, abortion became politicized. The right of a woman to reproductive freedom turned from being a medical issue and it became instead a religiously focused political issue, not a fight about persons or personhood, but rather an ideological struggle for partisan power driven by males. This too was the state of affairs in Montana in the 1990s when healthcare providers sued, seeking a determination that Montana's then existing anti-abortion laws violated women's constitutional right to abortion services. Recall in my opening, I noted that it is a well-settled principle of constitutional law that while a state may not provide less protection of a federal constitutional right, it may provide greater protection under its own constitution. Roe versus Wade was grounded in the federal constitutional rights of equal protection and to due process. However, in Armstrong versus State, 
the Montana Supreme Court turned solely to Montana's constitution instead of to the federal constitution. Montanans are guaranteed the federal fundamental right of individual privacy under Article 2, Section 10 of our constitution. And that right states, and I quote, the right of individual privacy is essential to the well being of a free society and shall not be infringed without the showing of a compelling state interest. Fundamental constitutional rights are the most stringently protected rights in our Constitution. Legislation infringing such a right is reviewed under strict scrutiny analysis, meaning that the legislation must be justified by a compelling state interest and must be narrowly tailored to effectuate only that compelling interest. With this standard in mind, the court carefully considered the history of the right of individual privacy and determined this right guaranteed that a woman was entitled to make medical judgments affecting her bodily integrity and health, including obtaining a pre-viability abortion in partnership with her chosen healthcare provider, free from government interference. Importantly, Armstrong was grounded independently and solely in the right of individual privacy and other fundamental rights protected in Montana's constitution. Armstrong was not decided on the basis of federal constitutional law. Indeed, Montana's constitution provides greater protection for women's rights, appropriative autonomy, the right to choose, than does the federal constitution. Thus, Regardless of what happens to Roe in the federal courts, Montana women will continue to be guaranteed their constitutional privacy right to seek abortion services based upon the medical model free from male-driven partisan and religious meddling. Montana's Article 2, Section 10 guarantees women that right. So that's another thing that Montana's constitution can do for you and demand that the legislature and the governor and the attorney general respect this right. Because as I note later, these agencies of state government are already trying to take it away from you to substitute their political ideology and religious beliefs in place of your fundamental right of individual privacy. And here's another of your constitutional rights that, government, that the government is after. The right to vote is fundamental to the existence of democracy. Montana's constitution at Article 2, Section 1 provides in the strongest possible terms that, and I again quote, all political power is vested in and derived from the people and is founded upon their will only. And Article 2, Section 2 provides that it is the people who have the exclusive right of governing themselves. It follows, however, that if we can't vote, we have no political power and thus no ability to participate in self-government. The ability to vote is we the people's way of getting our official say in who governs, who leads, and what laws are enacted or repealed. Without the right of suffrage, we have no ability or power to ensure that our fundamental constitutional rights are protected. Those guarantees include our right to life, liberty, to own property, to a clean and healthful environment, the freedom of religion, to assemble, to free speech, to a free press, to participate in government, to examine public documents, to observe the deliberation of public bodies, to individual privacy, to bear arms, to equal protection of the laws and to due process of law, and to our most fundamental right, our right of inviolable human dignity. If we can't vote, then our voices will not be heard. And these rights will be devoid of any real substance and meaning. That's why Montana's constitution at Article 2, Section 13, protects our fundamental right to vote in the strongest terms. This section provides, and I quote, right of suffrage. All elections shall be free and open, and no power, civil or military, shall at any time interfere to prevent 
the free exercise of the right of suffrage. The women and men framing our Montana Constitution use this extremely clear and explicit language to at one and the same time recognize the importance of our franchise and to protect that fundamental right from being impaired by, among others, government actors. In no uncertain terms, our Constitution requires that all, not just some, but every election, one, must be free and open, that is, exempt from external authority, interference, or restriction, and two, that no power, civil, and that includes members of the legislature, the executive, and the judicial branches, or military, three, shall at any time, that is, before, during, or after an election, never, for interfere to prevent, that is to hinder or stop by law or other direct or indirect means or meddling. Five, the free exercise, that is each person's personal right and liberty interest. Six, of the right of suffrage, our right to vote. The US Supreme Court has left it up to the states to regulate voting. This is important because again, while the state cannot provide less protection of a constitutional right, the state constitution can provide more protections of a civil right than does the federal constitution. Thus, even if voter suppression laws may not offend the federal constitution, those same laws will offend Montana's constitution since our constitution provides greater protection of the right of suffrage than does the federal constitution. In the fight to undo partisan voting suppression, Montana law, not federal law, controls. Because of these greater protections of our right to vote, no bureaucrat, no civil power, no legislature, no governor, no secretary of state, no one can impair or prevent we the people from exercising our right of suffrage. Yet, contrary to what the Constitution requires, the 2021 session of Montana's legislature enacted and the governor signed into law bills that do in fact, and I quote, interfere to prevent the free exercise of the right of suffrage, end quote. Those bills include HB 176, closing same day voter registration, HB 530, requiring the secretary of state to adopt administrative rules prohibiting a person from accepting a pecuniary benefit in exchange for distributing, ordering, requesting, collecting, or delivering ballots, and SB 169, which revise, revises voter identification laws and revises certain identification requirements for voter registration and voting. The 2021 legislature and our governor have made it harder to vote, have made elections less free and open, and have interfered with our right of suffrage. Not surprisingly, these laws are being challenged in court, and if our Montana courts enforce the plain language of Article 2, Section 13, these three laws will be ruled unconstitutional. And that's one more way when Montana's constitution works for you. Here's another. Article 2, Section 9 guarantees another unique right. And I quote, no person shall be deprived of the right to examine documents or observe the deliberations of all public bodies or agencies of state government and its subdivisions, except in cases in which the demand of individual privacy clearly exceeds the merits of public disclosure. This is one of the few rights in Montana's constitution that does not require any sort of statutory implementation, meaning that if it is violated, an aggrieved party can sue directly on the basis of this right. Yet this right, too, is under attack by the government that should be protecting it. Theoretically, you should be able to go into any office or agency of government in Montana and obtain copies of documents that are not otherwise sealed or made private by law. I say theoretically because actually it isn't that easy. Let me give you a couple of examples. For one thing, government actors and agencies charge exorbitant fees 
to get the documents you want. The Billings Gazette and other newspapers have asked for various, have asked for various public documents from Montana's Public Service Commission. And the price tag on that, $31,000, 31 grand to produce documents that the public is constitutionally entitled to see and a request by a newspaper to see a portion of Superintendent of Public Instruction, Elsie Arnson's official schedule. The cost for those public documents, 200 bucks. Give me a break. Rather than frustrating the public's right to know, the legislature should be enacting laws to prevent bureaucratic and agency price gouging, to foster transparency, and to protect our Article II, Section 9 right to know. And here's another fact. Montana's newspapers have been subsidizing the public's right to know for decades. Nearly every Montana Supreme Court decision vindicating the public's right to know was filed and prosecuted by a newspaper or group of newspapers with costs and attorney's fees amounting to many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Costs and fees, which those papers have never recovered, although being entitled to. Indeed, were it not for our free press, we the public would not have any constitutional right to know law. The public would be left in the dark. We need laws to require that the government actor or agency pay the costs and attorney's fees of, successful, of a successful plaintiff in a right to know case. And finally, Daryl Ehrlich, editor and publisher of the Daily Montana, has recently written about a problem of high tax paid agency spokespersons who will not take calls from journalists. One more way to frustrate the public's constitutional right to know. Here's the takeaway. We the people have a fundamental right to know and our government agencies are frustrating this way in every way possible. To make our constitution work for us, we need to demand these practices stop. We need laws to make sure they stop and we need to throw out of office every public official that won't make it stop. Finally, I ask you to indulge me in one more part of my constitutional vision. Unlike the federal constitution, Montana's constitution has another very important right. In fact, in my mind, the most important right of all, and that is the right of inviolable human dignity. Article two, section four starts quite simply with these powerful words, and I quote, the dignity of the human being is inviolable, end quote. Human dignity is perhaps the most fundamental right in the Declaration of Rights. This right is inviolable, meaning that it is safe from violation, incapable of being violated. Significantly, the right of human dignity is the only right in Montana's constitution that is inviolable. It is the only right in Article II carrying the absolute prohibition of inviolability. No individual may be stripped of her or his human dignity under the plain language of the Dignity Clause. No private or governmental entity has the right or the power to do so. Human dignity simply cannot be violated, no exceptions. Human dignity is not protected in the federal constitution, at least textually. And having seen immigrant children in cages, sleeping on concrete floors, immigrant families being torn apart, and states empowering vigilantes to harass and sue women and doctors who seek and provide abortion services, one wonders if human dignity is protected at all federally. But what exactly is human dignity? It would be impractical here to attempt to provide an exhaustive definition. Rather, the legal meaning of this term must be fleshed out on a case-by-case -case basis by the courts and the legislature. I note, however, a couple of interpretations that are useful for our purposes of discussion, and I'm quoting here from other sources without attribution. Human dignity refers to a worth or value that flows from an inner source. It is not bestowed from the outside, but is rather intrinsic to the person. To have dignity means to look at oneself 
with self-respect, with some sort of satisfaction. We feel human, not degraded. Dignity has typically been associated with the normative ideal of individual persons as intrinsically valuable, as having inherent worth as individuals, at least in part because of their capacity for independent, autonomous, rational, and responsible action. Dignity is directly violated by degrading or demeaning a person. Dignity is indirectly violated by denying a person the opportunity to direct or control his or her own life in such a way that his or her worth is questioned or dishonored. Indeed, respect for dignity of each individual demands that people have for themselves the moral right and moral responsibility to confront the most fundamental questions about the meaning and value of their own lives and the intrinsic value of life in general, answering to their own consciences and convictions. Given its intrinsic nature, human dignity transcends the Constitution and the law. Dignity is a fundamental component of humanness. It is inherent in human self-consciousness. Dignity belongs intrinsically to our species, to each of us, as a natural right from birth through death. It permeates each person regardless of who that person is or what she or he does. It cannot be abrogated because of one's status or condition. While the government may certainly impinge on privacy rights, liberty interests, and other Article II Section rights, two rights in proper circumstances, the individual always retains his or her right to human dignity. So too do persons suffering from mental illness or disability and involuntary commitment. Each retains the right to demand of the state that her and his dignity as a human being is respected despite the government's sometimes necessary interference in the person's life. It follows therefore that to make our constitution work for us, our courts and our legislature must adjudicate and legislate with this constitutional right of human dignity in mind. Think of what that would mean. Disability rights would be protected. No manner of description would be allowed, including without limitation, discrimination based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, sex or ident gender identity, or social status or condition. Women would be paid equally with men. The homeless would be properly housed, sheltered, and fed. People would not go to bed hungry or without necessary medical treatment. The consequences are too endless to enumerate. We Americans claim to be a God-fearing and religious people. We're far from that ideal to be sure, but we would be much closer if we simply recognized and honored the innate human dignity of each of our brothers and sisters. So in my vision of the constitution, I would count human dignity as a right against which all others must be balanced a right which would serve as the overarching template for court decisions and legislation. Human dignity would inform governance at all levels. So I briefly discussed five examples of how we can make our state and federal constitutions work for us. But there are other equally pressing present day issues and technologies that are affecting not only our generation, but will affect generations far into the future. I'm refer referring to the exponential advancements being made in artificial intelligence and in genetic engineering, for example. Let me add this caution in closing, and frankly, it pains me to even talk about this. But our constitutions and the values they enshrine are under attack. Indeed, I believe that we're standing on edge, looking into the abyss of authoritarianism and fascism. To this point, in November 22nd of 2021, just a couple of months ago, 
the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance based in Stockholm, Sweden, released its 2021 report on the global state of democracy. The report's introduction begins with these chilling statements. And I quote, democracy is at risk. Its survival is endangered by a perfect storm of threats from both within and from the rising tide of authoritarianism. The world is becoming more authoritarian as non-democratic regimes become even more brazen in their represent or repression and many democratic governments suffer from backsliding by adopting their tactics of restricting speech or restricting freedom of speech and weakening the rule of law. The report identifies the United States as one of those backsliding democracies, meaning that it has experienced uh, significant weakenings of checks on government and civil liberties, such as freedom of expression and uh, freedom of assembly and association over time. Tom Nichols, in his recent book, Our Own Worst Enemy, describes much the same thing, noting that we, as a people, are more narcissistic, more racist, more consumerified, and more vengeful than at any time in our history. We've no doubt asked ourselves over the past five years, why do people vote against their interests? Nichols has provided the only answer that makes sense, that makes any sense to me. He posits that we suffer from confirmation bias, that is, we listen to and read what we want to hear and already believe. We applaud and vote for politicians that tell us what we want to hear. And this has manifested itself in a very malignant way. We no longer care about what our chosen political, political leaders can do for us. Rather, we vote for and encourage those politicians who will hurt our perceived enemies. It is not what you can do for me. It's how you are going to marginalize, demonize, and nullify those who don't agree with my partisan or religious ideologies. Nichols describes this as the power of resentment. And he describes how authoritarian governments weaponize this mindset against the them in them versus us. And this I suggest is how we turn our governance over to those who would deconstruct our constitutions. That is the myths or the tyrants, the authoritarians, the fascists, and how our democracy dies, not from without, but from within. And there are politicians in this state who are already dishonoring the rule of law and our constitutional values. By way of example, last November, right here in Montana, Derek Skies, a Republican state legislator representing Kalispell, was heard lamenting that Montana's constitutional right of privacy has given the courts the legal basis for blocking abortion restrictions and justification for murdering babies. He stated, the courts have humongously failed, and we need to throw out Montana's socialist rag of a constitution. Ski seems to forget that when he was sworn in as a public official, he took an oath to support and protect and defend Montana's constitution. But more to the point, Ski's vituperation is exactly the sort of authoritarian attack that dictators around the world level at constitutions enshrining democratic values. People like Vladimir Putin, Viktor Orban, Alexander Lushchenko, to name a few. And this mindset also breeds the sort of violence that rewards and makes heroes out of insurrectionists and those who haven't taken an assault weapon to a public assembly find that as justification to use the weapon to harm others and then themselves claim self-defense. It serves to justify threats against public officials, school board members, and healthcare workers. It serves to justify partisan thuggery by public officials against the governed and against other elected officials and the minority party. Indeed, the threat of actual violence against members of Congress 
is real and is growing, said Ted Deutsch of Florida, a Democrat who leads the Health Ethics Committee. He said, now more than ever, many of us fear for our physical safety. And as I've already discussed, Montana, as well as a number of other states, have passed voter suppression laws to ensure one party rule to the exclusion of other parties and candidates. Rigging the system in such a manner is not constitutional. This is not the rule of law, but the rule of lie. Indeed, the rule of the big lie. I raise these examples simply to make this point. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Our constitutions cannot protect themselves from authoritarian takeover. Democracy and the maintenance of our constitutions require the active support, protection, and defense of each of us. We cannot formulate a vision of the constitution that works for us, as I'm suggesting we should, if the constitution and the rule of law are ripped asunder by the fascists, the authoritarians, and the dictator wannabes in our midst. So with that, I'm going to close in accordance with Andy Warhol's rule, always leave them wanting less. I want you to leave here tonight with that question I posed in mind. What can my state and federal constitutions do for me, my family, my state, and my country? I want you to leave here secure in the knowledge that our constitutions belong to we the people, not to the government, not to corporations, to special interests, or to wealth and privilege, and most certainly not to the authoritarians and fascists that want to destroy them. Our constitutions belong to us. Know that our constitutions are living documents, fully adaptable to and capable of meeting the critically important challenges of our world now and into the, into the future, to infinity and beyond, as Buzz Lightyear would say. I ask you to go home and read your constitutions. Keep them in your mind when you quiz candidates, when you listen to debates, when you campaign and vote, when you run for political office, when you perform your work. Make your constitutional vision part of you, part of your life's experience. Live it. I ask you to form your constitutional vision and take the risk that yours is a vision, not of what is, but what could be and should be. Don't ask why, ask why not. Think outside the box. To be sure thinking outside the box is risky. Forming your own constitutional vision is risky and acting on your vision is riskier still. But know too, that risk is part of our human experience. As the playwright Neil Simon once observed, if no one ever took a risk, Michelangelo would have painted the Sistine Chapel floor. So on your vision of our constitutions, don't paint the floor, paint the ceiling. Thank you. <laughs>